a massive young person, and Dr. Enoch Wilf. Uh, Dr. Enoch Wilf will do a, an interview with um, Mr. Prosser very shortly, but first of all, Ambassador Prosser, we'd like to hear a few words from you. Justin, Elizabeth, thank you. It's a huge pleasure to be back and be at Westminster here, and uh, especially with this uh, amazing crowd. What can I tell you? It's much, uh, much nicer being here than uh, standing at the United Nations. <laughs> uh, well, as you know, uh, I came to New York in 2011 after serving here in the court of St. James. I don't think the Queen is still recovered from my departure. <laughs> but uh, one of the first things that I had to deal with is uh, the Council on Human Rights. This is a, a body that I don't have to tell you. It's been in the news lately. Jeffersonian democracies like Syria and Libya chaired this organization. This is like having a Jack the Ripper run Scotland Yard. But the interesting thing is, and this is important for everyone here to hear, is that there is an Article 4 there, the Council on Human Rights, that deals with human rights violations all over the world. 193 countries. Article 4 deals with human rights violations all over the world. There's a single Article 7 that singles out only one country in the world, and that is Israel. Now, there's some odd things happening at the UN, which I'll introduce to you in seconds. But you would think, OK, who would vote against this outrageous uh, singling out of Israel? So the United States, Canada, Israel, and the great empire of Palau <laughs> vote against. And yours truly, the United Kingdom, abstains. Why are you abstaining? I mean, I hope we have here, I can't uh, recognize the people from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office of this great nation. Uh, to explain why, I mean, Israel cannot be at least with a group of uh, interesting countries like uh, Libya, Syria, and North Korea. I mean, why single us out? We can knock our game. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that in this organization, the bias which is, is deliberate, it's systematic. And everything I'm going to say, I'm going to try and substantiate. So uh, we have the World Health Organization meet approximately a month ago. And the only country being singled out and denounced in health with this with amazing medical facilities, hospitals, and doctors is Israel. Conference on the status of women a month ago. 193 countries gather in New York. Who do they choose to sing around in treatment against women? Not Afghanistan, not Saudi Arabia, not Iran, Israel. Now, why am I telling you that? Because we have a tendency, and rightly, this is what makes us a bit different than others, to look at ourselves in the mirror and basically say, look, some of the attitudes towards us are part and parcel of the way we behave. Well, that's obviously true. But when you look at things happening to Israel, because of the numbers, it has nothing to do with what Israel does, and I gave you some examples. And the last one that I was dealing with for the last month is the undersecretary that deals with children and armed conflict. Undersecretary Zerugi that basically decided to put Israel on a blacklist of countries that deliberate and systematically kill children. And who is on this blacklist? These, you know, want to be on certain lists. On the list are Al Qaeda, ISIS, Taliban, and Boko Haram. In the report, 
because we want to be factored, right? In the report, there are 17 paragraphs on children in Syria. There are nine on children in Yemen, eight on children in Iraq, six on children in Libya, and 32 paragraphs on Israel. I saw here, checking thing empirically. This is what Israel is dealing with on the battlefield every day. And what I'm trying to tell you here is that the battlefield has changed dramatically. If in the past they tried to get to Israel through military means, that didn't work out. They tried to come on the boycotts, the Arab boycotts. Today the battlefield is on the international level by trying to frame Israel as an international program and basically going out to the values that we all cherish, that identify us, and basically connect between Israel and the diaspora around us. And this is maybe the toughest battle that we have ever dealt with. And it's happening every day. And this battlefield is a battlefield that reminds me of its like Chinese torture. Drop, 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 flies, half-truths that have an accumulated effect. And we have to stand up every day. And I can tell you that when I came to the United Nations, I looked at it like one one in economics. You have demand side and supply side. There's demand for demonization and delegitimization against Israel, but there's also demand for Israel's know-how. So let's supply the know-how. We'll never reach equilibrium, but in the sense, try and present to the world what Israel is all about, by the way. Not so many know what is obvious to many in this room. How do you do that? You come out and you try and run resolutions, Israeli resolutions, on entrepreneurship for development. Everyone told me, don't start, you'll be humiliated. A year and a half work, 141 countries, some do not have diplomatic ties with Israel, raise their hand for an Israeli resolution, Kahol The ambassador of Tanzania approaches the stage and says, I have a lot to say about Israel and Palestine, but what Israel is doing in Africa is absolutely amazing. I nearly jumped and hugged him on stage. <laughs> Rita, an Israeli diva, singer, I'm out to New York, I see her singing in Farsi and in Hebrew. I said, God, I should bring it to the UN. This is like Simon and Garfunkel. Garfunkel was in Israel now, bridge over troubled water just to work on it. And the Arabs and the Iranians all writing letters, bottom line, Rita appeared in the General Assembly, sang in Farsi and in Hebrew. 129 countries were there. I think the Iranians also peeped in to listen. And they're still talking about it until today. So basically trying to present every day what Israel is all about, we can be very proud of it, what Israel is all about. Jumping to something different. The UN is an amazing vantage point to what happens now in the Middle East. Nation state are disintegrating before our eyes. Libya, Syria, Yemen, Iraq, completely different uh, setting. And at the UN, you can see it happening before your eyes, changing coalitions. The Saudi ambassador approaches the podium, points towards the Iranian ambassador. What's your name, what it matters? You, yeah? Arif. 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 You'll be the Iranian ambassador today. <laughs> the Saudi ambassador points towards the Iranian ambassador and says, you trying to assassinate my ambassador, Abdul Jubel, in Washington, D.C., in a nice restaurant called Cafe Milano, which is two rooms and one shop. 
an amazing restaurant in Georgetown. He's space shaped in physically, he's never done that before. The Iranian ambassador stands up and goes after the Saudi ambassador. The Saudi ambassador goes after Bashar Jaffrey, the Syrian ambassador. Bashar Jaffrey has a tendency to lie for 50 consecutive minutes. When he snores, he lies. But beyond giving you the feel of how it looks, when the risks are enormous, this is a window of opportunity because coinciding interests between the Saudis, the Gulfis, Jordanians, and a different Egypt is a window of opportunity that we won't have for very long. And we have to utilize it because they feel not because they're interested on the Palestinian issue. Forget that. They feel that the rope is tightening around their necks because of Iran. So they're willing to do stuff today that they were not willing to do for years. And we, especially with everything that is going around us, it's important not just to look at the risks, but also the opportunities which are there. The Saudis always remind me of those two elderly gentlemen in the market show, all different standard, sitting on the balcony and shouting, it's a lousy show. <laughs> this time now, they're willing to put up these things and do something. We have to be there. Peacekeeping forces. Many talk about the importance of peacekeeping forces between Israel, Palestinians, or the Jordan River. Let's talk about peacekeeping forces. Peacekeeping forces during Gamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt, 1967, I don't have to remind you. The philosophy in which Gamal Abdel Nasser told the UN forces to move out from Sinai is still in the Guinea's World Book of Records and the philosophy in which they ran out. But as we speak, I remind you, there are UNDO forces between Israel and Syria since 1974. They are protecting Israel and Syria since 1974. The most dramatic thing that they had to do in the last 40 years is to rescue a goat or a cow from a barbed wire on the Golan. Suddenly, in the last few years, they have been shooting on the Golan, as you know. The Austrian force, approximately a year ago, said, too much shooting going on. We want to go back to Vienna to drink him a lunch and eat a zafarto. <laughs> they want to go out in three weeks, because not so fast. Three weeks, they were back to Vienna. And we all stood in suspense, waiting for the force from Fiji to arrive at the shores to help us between Israel and Nicola. Why am I telling you the story? Because as we speak now at Westminster, all UNDO forces, except for 66 Nepalis, which are on the Syrian Fermon, they used to buy out the Jews. All of them are over in Israel. Factually, I'm making it funny, but this is the situation. Okay, so for all those who think peacekeeping forces as a solution, science fiction. Israel will protect itself by itself. I want to tell you it doesn't make a difference where you stand politically, left or right. What is conducted against Israel in the United Nations by the Palestinians is nothing less than political terror every day. Even if you take into consideration discounts on the fact that they are the weakest party and they should use a certain platform every day and using the international forms, especially the United Nations, in trying to really move the conflict in a, to internationalize the conflict, it's absolutely incredible. And like I say, and I'd like to end it by telling you that every day I enter the United Nations. And if you look very well, you see 15 flags with a crescent on them. You see 25 flags with a cross on it. There's only one flag with a star of David on it. So some countries, this is one flag too many. And I walk those corridors, 
every day, tall and proud, knowing who I represent and what I represent in this family of nations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Ron. Now, recently I had a chance to speak with uh, students, a mission of students who came to Israel, who were considered some of the best and brightest. They were the recipients of the four top scholarships and fellowships in the United States, uh, Rhodes, Truman, other fellowships. And when somehow we got to the issue of the United Nations, and I mentioned that the United Nations is structurally biased against Israel, they took personal offense. And those are some of the best educated, smartest people out there. So what do you do in a world that still views the United Nations, broadly speaking, positively? Let's put the United Nations on the positive side of it. What do you do when this organization is structurally biased against Israel? How do you then convey the theater of the absurd to a broader world uh, without telling them perhaps things that they don't want to hear. Well, first, uh, I think it's important to say that the United Nations, with uh, everything that I'm saying, I feel it's an important body. It's been hijacked. It is absolutely important. You look, if, you know, and I mentioned the World Health Organization vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Amazing stuff. Ebola peacekeeping forces, who would send peacekeeping forces over to Mali? Uh, uh, when you look at sustainable development, the work that is done in, in Africa, this is amazing stuff that is done by, by the United Nations and its agencies. The problem are the numbers, okay? I'd like to tell you the numbers, and the numbers play an amazing role with the UN. You have 22 countries of the Arab League. 57 countries of the Organization of Islamic Countries, and 126 countries of the non-aligned world. Now what happens is that if you want to get voted in to, let's look at the Security House, okay, which is the boardroom of the world, you need two-thirds of the votes of 193 countries, which is 129 countries. So Canada, a couple of years ago, has nothing to do with this, it just doesn't get voted in. Even if you are, you know, because their policies on the array of issues, women, LGBT, other stuff, doesn't fit the majority. So you have a bias, and what happens is that those countries are slowly taking over. Now, again, Let's zoom out. Out of the 193 countries of the United Nations, only 87 are democracies by UN standards, not by mine. So we have to, to try and bring back some sanity to an organization that in some cases has been hijacked by, uh, by organizations and countries that have nothing to do with like-minded countries. So on bringing back sanity, sometimes I argue that the United Nations are united only when it's against Israel. And the issue is, how can you bring sanity when the numbers are against you, when there's no difference of value, when good countries, to be very, uh, you know, very simplistic, good countries have one vote, and bad countries have but one vote. What can be done to bring sanity and in many ways to show that the treatment of Israel by the organization is a shame for the organization rather than a shame for Israel. It's true. It's a, it's a long, long way and we have to, like I said, every day stand up enough and, and tell the world what Israel is all about. And it's, it's hard, it's challenging, but what, that's the only thing is Try to convey that every day. And, uh, and I have to tell you, I'm not frustrated. It's challenging because it's tough. But I can tell you that under the radar screen, there's a completely different reality. It's like I see Knesset member Barlev here. 
it's like the difference between, it's, it's a problem. So under the radar screen, the, the respect towards Israel in Africa, in, in the, you know, South America, the former Soviet Union, the Caribbean Islands, is amazing. And we are working on a credit line that people before us worked very hard to establish. Kibbutznikim and Moshavnikim that went out to the remotest places in Africa. People that we touched or came into courses in Israel, which we should do much more, they are the best ambassadors we can have. And I can see them at the UN and the different agencies. Uh, the ambassador of Jamaica, his father worked in the Volcanic Institute, they can tell him a lot about he was a child in Israel. So we have to be able to go out there and bring as many people to see Israel. So we don't have a problem being criticized, but it has to be fair. And if you think about it, Israel is on the front line and counting phenomena that Western democracies have yet to encounter. You know, the best example I can give you, people don't think about it, we began checking people at airports 30 years ago. What did people say? Oi vei vei, privacy, human rights, how can you touch me, how can you? Fast forward, democracies have to find ways to defend themselves. So there's a calibration on how you defend yourself and not go overboard in your reaction. But the fact that democracies need tools in order to, this is something that we'll see happening. And instead of pointing fingers at us, I think especially Israelis need someone to give them a big hug every day. You talked about the under the radar. What could be done to bring the under the radar above the radar? Uh, some discussions, for example, are taking place on India. Might India, a former major leader of the non-aligned movement, change its votes. You talked about opportunities that we have. Are there opportunities to go take this sympathy, take people who think differently, and get them to behave contrary to the numbers, to openly support Israel, to change their votes? I think there is. I think there is. Although there's a, there's a problem, because the UN, let's take India, for example. Amazing bilateral relationship military, defense, economic relationship. India votes, the ambassador of India is a very, very good friend of mine, loves Israel. India votes against Israel in every committee and every subcommittee. Uh, it's not just the non-alignment issue. And by the way, in brackets, non-alignment, 1955, the Bandung Conference, Nero, Sukarno, and Tito, India, Indonesia, and Yugoslavia, basically say we're not part of the Soviet bloc, we're not part of the Iraq, we're non-aligned. Now, there's no price tag in parentheses for bad behavior against Israel. Because if I try and do something, I get a phone call from a Didi Ahari from the fire and says, Zoran, calm down. Those are working places for Israel. So there's a, a balance that I hope that with Modi today would change a bit uh, because uh, it's uh, quite convenient for certain countries to do that, but we have to work very hard to, uh, to change that. And I want to raise the issue that you mentioned also, the political terror, diplomatic terror. The UN is considered, so many now say, look, it's great. The Palestinians, the Arab side, are finally pursuing a policy of non-violent struggle. Non-violent means against Israel. Uh, and somehow they expect us to celebrate this and to say, well, the, the struggle is on nonviolent. Clearly, we're dealing with the Mandela, Gandhi, and Martin Luther King on the other side. And you're describing a situation, and I share with you uh, this analysis, that while a struggle can be nonviolent in its means, ultimately it creates an environment that is an invitation to violence. And I wondered if you could describe how you see it in your work, this kind of long that might very quickly move from what is supposedly a nonviolent struggle to an invitation ultimately to violence. And I'll just say that the United Nations and other organizations, whether it's FIFA or UNHRC, ultimately are the places where 
a new vision is presented to the world, and that is a world without Israel. You talked about one flag too many. This is the new salvation. The new image of salvation is a world without Israel would be a better world. And the best place to send this message are international organizations. So do you see that sense of nonviolence might be turning to violence? Well, we find it differently. I think, like I, like I said before, I'm not surprised that they're using a platform like the United Nations. Uh, but I'm looking at what they are what they're doing, basically everything that Israel is doing is illegitimate. So when I come and present a Israeli resolution on entrepreneurship for development or agricultural technologies, not only do they don't vote for it, but they run and try and do as much as they can because in their eyes, Israel is not, the, it's not even legitimate for it to present a resolution. Uh, and this, when you see that every day, you really understand that uh, we we have to to go after that because we have uh, left this terrain open for many many years, uh, and that's what we should be doing. We should be going and saying, "Hey, dear friends, it's all very nice." to try and divert things and impose a solution from the outside. <coughs> not, not, it's not going, only not going to lead to peace, it's going to lead to additional violence. You raise frustrations, you raise expectations. At the end of the day, you create the next conflict, not the next uh, solution. So uh, this is something that I think we should, uh, we should keep in mind. And uh, again, from my point of view, continue to show what Israel is all about because it's so effective when you bring out you know women disabilities people people are amazing ambassadors for Israel in every field I'm telling you it's really I'm proud to see them representing Israel in the different committees uh, and the world has a lot to learn from Israel we also have to be a bit humble and learn from the world a time or two, but, uh, but it's quite it's it's quite interesting to keep on doing that uh, without giving up. So let's just end on the note of peace and the possibility of peace. You discussed the possibility of regional realignment, creating opportunities that we must seize. But could we find ourselves in danger? And this is something I'm concerned about that as there is a real set opportunity, and there is a realignment, because the world has mobilized, so many in the world have mobilized to support the Palestinians in that view that Israel and Zionism are this ultimate evil. How can peace ever emerge from that if you're telling the other side, you're not dealing with fellow human beings who happen to have conflicting goals, you're dealing with evil. And with evil, you don't make peace. So could we be in a situation where the United Nations, contrary to its goal and contrary to how many people see it, might be even frustrating the opportunity for peace rather than promoting it? I think the United Nations in, in the structures, you know, like I said, 1945, 51 member states, today 193, only 87 of democracies. And has to find a way to make a differentiation in a sense. How do you do it? It's a long seminar. I have some ideas. But uh, you have other things that are frustrating, not Israel. If you are India or Brazil, and you sit there and you see, you know, the five permanent members who have a veto power, the ones that fought the Nazis, in essence, the United States, Russia, Britain, France, and they fought in China with Dr. Chiang Kai-shek, which wasn't a communist then, only in 1971 with China, or communist China came in. Brazil and India sit there, Germany and Japan, and say, excuse me that I'm saying you here at Westminster, I mean, why, why do the Brits and the French have a veto power? We're in Brazil. We're India. 
This is not 1945, this is 2015. So in the sense, they also would like a different posture from their point of view, and you know what? I can see that, okay? Uh, I'm not talking about the Israeli prison, what's good for Israel, but I'm saying from their own. And the UN is an amazing place because you move from place to place and so many things that you wouldn't really connect to. I go into a meeting on global war with all the sarcasm of Israel's ambassador to the United Nations, the peace with life and death. You enter the room and the whole world opens up for you for countries that feel, you know, here at contingency plans to take the people to New Zealand or to Australia, they're crying on stage. You really connect to them. You move the camera and you move over to Africa. And it's a different feel in Africa towards, you know, how the world sees Africa. And then you move somewhere else. And the world is a complicated place. And I think, uh, what we in Israel should try and do, and I'm repeating that for the third, third time, is to tell the world, you know, look at Israel. Yes, we're not angels, but we are out there every day trying to defend our citizens on the one hand and to, to be an amazing democracy. And, uh, you know, if our former president, Shimon Peres, would be here, he would say, you know, and uh, this contribution of Jews to the world is dissatisfaction. Have you ever seen that? No, 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 no. So I'm creative, innovative, inventive. We should continue to be dissatisfied. And then through that, this, this dissatisfaction after 67 years, instead of oranges, we're now exporting orange mobile phones. Instead of apples, we're designing Apple computers. We are exporting, I think, gluten-free pasta to Italy, caviar to Russia from a kibbutz in the north, and wine to France. And we're sending satellites up into space that say shalom to very few other satellites. <laughs> <laughs> so we must be doing something right. And like I said, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing to walk and represent Israel and this family of nations. Uh, and you, everyone in this room, could be very, very proud of what this was stands for. So that was Thank you.